Good evening, everyone. Hello, hello. It's great to see your faces as they disappear as the lights go down. Um, my name is Melanie McNair. I'm the Senior Director of Public Programming here. Uh, how many of you are visiting the Center for Fiction for the first time this evening? Oh, a bunch of you. Well, welcome. Uh, if you don't know us, the Center for Fiction is the only literary nonprofit that focuses on the creation and enjoyment of fiction. Uh, and so, of course, celebrating Jennifer Egan fits really well with that. Um, let's see. Um, how many? Well, OK. Sorry, I went off script. Um, so. Uh, yes, I already said that. Um, okay, a couple of housekeeping announcements. Uh, we will have an audience Q&A, and it'll be a little bit longer probably tonight. Um, but we do have an audience in addition to this amazing group here who are watching online. So if you have a question, raise your hand, and one of our fabulous interns will bring a microphone to you. So wait until you have the microphone so that everybody can hear your question. And if you're on the live stream, you can type your question in the chat. Um, at any time, and we'll get to those before we end up in the evening. Um, that's, I really, I had something really good I wanted to say, and now I can't remember what it was. Um, well, I guess I just want to say uh, that aren't we lucky because we're all here because we share something that we love. Um, so let me introduce our guest. Jennifer Egan is the author of several novels and a short story collection. Her 2017 novel, Manhattan Beach, a New York Times bestseller, was awarded the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction and was chosen as a New York's, New York's one book, one New York read. How many of you read Manhattan Beach? Yeah, like clap. Woo! Um, her previous novel, A Visit from the Goon Squad, won the 2011 Pulitzer Prize, the National Book Critics Circle Award, and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, and was named one of the best books of the decade by Time Magazine and Entertainment Weekly. How many of you read A Visit from the Goon Squad? All right. Um, she's also a journalist and has written frequently in the New York Times Magazine, and she recently completed a term as the president of PEN America. Her new novel, The Candy House, um, which is a sibling from a visit from the Goon Squad, has its uh, paperback debut tonight, and that's why we're all here to celebrate it. So welcome, Jennifer, to the stage. Thank you so much, Melanie. Um, thank you all for coming. It's great to be here. Um, I love being a neighbor of the Center for Fiction. It's like having a neighbor with a gigantic, beautiful house and an amazing library that I can visit in five minutes. Um, and I want to especially thank my incredible publishing team who is here. I have worked with many publishers in my time, and there is no one like Scribner. They are my allies and collaborators, and I'm so happy that you're here. So I'm going to do something uh, tonight that I have frankly hardly done at all since The Candy House came out a year ago, and that is read from it. <laughs> I've had amazing conversations uh, all over the place, but I think one legacy of the Zoom era, apologies already to those of you on Zoom, uh, is that there are fewer and fewer actual readings because they tend not to work that well on Zoom. And so we've all sort of pivoted toward conversations, which are great, but I miss the readings, both as a reader and as an audience member. So thank you in advance for indulging me um, in reading tonight. And I will be very happy to have a conversation afterwards, not with an interlocutor on stage, but with all of you as interlocutors. And just a word before I start, um, my writing method involves spewing out blind improvisational first drafts by hand that hopefully give me ideas I couldn't have thought of consciously. And A Visit from the Goon Squad, which was published in 2010, was written in that way as, at the beginning, just some freestanding stories that I didn't think had any connection to each other. So by the time I discovered they were all part of one book, the defining traits of that book had really already been decided. Each chapter would be about a different person, each chapter would stand on its own, and each would have its own technical approach and feel like part of a different book from all of the others. 
The fun of it, hopefully, <laughs> lies in those juxtapositions, the surprise of seeing a situation or a person in one way and then from one chapter to the next with no regard for chronology, seeing them in a contradictory way. And the Candy House is very different from Goon Squad, but it too has those same three structural ideas guiding it. Lots of characters appear in both books, but there's only one who occupies a major role in both books, and that is a man named Lou Klein. Many people find him to be the least sympathetic character in A Visit from the Goon Squad, which may be one reason I wanted to take another crack at him um, and try to understand him better and help readers understand him better. Um, he's also the oldest character in both books, born in 1930. So I'm going to read very slimmed down versions um, of two beginnings of two adjacent chapters from The Candy House in which Lou Klein plays a major role and then I look forward to our conversation. So the first one that I'm gonna read from is called The Mystery of Our Mother. Long ago, she told us, when we were just a hope in her heart, or not even that, because she never wanted children, or thought she didn't, a higher power touched our mother's head and said, stop what you're doing, two little girls are waiting to be born and you need to have them right away because the world is desperate for their brightness. So she stopped studying anthropology, which she really did love, and maybe would study again someday when you're all grown up and don't need me anymore. We'll always need you. I'll always need you too, that's for sure. I'll try not to drive you crazy with my mommy needs. Till the end. Well, I stopped going to anthropology school, and I married your daddy, and we brought you into the world, and here you are. It all worked out perfectly. Where is daddy? You'll see him next week. He's taking you to ballet. Last time he never came. I'll be here, just in case. He can't make a bun. That's not important, honey. Before ballet? Don't whine, sweetie. He threw Tam Tam out the window of the car. He said she was moth-eaten. That was unfortunate. How could you marry him? Love is a mystery. Does daddy love you? He loves you, that's what matters. He said we were young spendthrifts. Did he now? He said, can we not talk about what he said? We're just telling you. I don't need to be told. I know your father very well. How did she endure these conversations? Of course our father didn't love her any more than she loved him. He was 15 years older than our mother, twice divorced when they met with four kids, two by each ex-wife. How's that for a rotten prospective husband? But he was charming, a famous record producer, and above all, we later surmised, he wouldn't take no for an answer. Why he wanted our mother to say yes is another mystery. She, they had nothing in common beyond a taste for beauty, his, and beauty, hers. <laughs> but she never lived by her beauty. She was the kind of mom who rarely wore makeup, who let her hair grow wild and didn't bother to shower on Sunday, her day off from the travel agency where she went to work after our father stranded her without any money to raise us. The Sun Nod apartment complex where we lived with our mother starting as toddlers in the late 1970s, the first home we remember, seemed to be populated entirely by females, aging B-movie actresses who took deliveries of gallo wine and gallon bottles, and aspiring starlets whose much older boyfriends had white stripes on their ring fingers. The apartments surrounded a garden containing a single gargantuan palm tree, either a relic of some agricultural prehistory of that patch of land, or a decorative feature that had bloated grotesquely out of scale with the modest complex it was decorating. The bedroom we shared with our mother faced a canopy of fronds, like the fingers of a dozen hands. Even on sunny days, it made a sound like rain. On Sunday mornings, we climbed into our mother's bed to be the monster, which meant lying with our chests on top of hers so that all of us could feel our three beating hearts, our hair tangled with her hair, and our breath melted into hers until we were one creature lying under the moving, whispering hands of another creature, the palm tree. The tree had a name, we told our mother, Herbert. What if it's a girl tree? A girl can be Herbert. 
Our mother propped herself on one elbow and studied us. There aren't a lot of men around here, are there? Do you wish you saw more of your daddy? No. He loves you very much. We love you. You can love us both, you know. No, we can't. Our parents' marriage collapsed when a San Francisco high school student washed up on their Malibu doorstep, having run away from home and hitchhiked south after our father seduced her on a business trip. We were three and four years old. Our father managed on paper to appear penniless. He left our mother with nothing but us, which by his calculation probably meant less than nothing. But for our mother, who had little else, we were infinite. She loved us infinitely in return and gave us that rare thing, a happy childhood. She never told us why she'd left our father. Much later, he did. On the occasions when our father showed up to take us to ballet, we walked grimly down the cracked outdoor steps from our second story apartment to one of his many cars. Hello, girls. One of you want to ride in front? We shook our heads. It wasn't safe. Everyone knew that, except him. <laughs> How about something to eat? We've got time before your class. We don't eat before a ballet. I can't do anything right with you two, can I? We shook our heads, and he laughed and began to drive. But when he pulled up in front of the strip mall where the ballet studio was, he turned around and peered at us in the back seat. I'm your father. You understand that, don't you? We nodded in stony unison. That's not nothing. That means something. He searched our cold eyes. You don't like me. Why? It was not a rhetorical question. He was curious, awaiting a reply. We looked at our father closely for perhaps the first time. His weathered surfer's tan and longish blonde hair, his crooked front teeth. He watched us watch him, and then he laughed. How would you know? You're just two little kids. One day, after ballet, our father told us that we weren't going straight home. We glowered. Does mommy know? Of course your mother knows. What do you think I am, a kidnapper? He drove stonily, our lack of enthusiasm clearly needling him. We played rock, paper, scissors in the back seat and pretended he wasn't there. Hey, try looking around for a change. We were driving along a cliff, the ocean shivering enormously below. It seemed a different world from the parched, flat one we inhabited with our mother, full of glittering cars in broiling asphalt lots. Eventually, we descended the cliff and pulled into the driveway of a house with tiled roofs and magenta flowers overflowing its walls. There were no other houses around it. Rock and roll crashed from inside the house, but our father walked us straight past it to a beach whose fine white sand was different from Venice Beach, where our mother often took us on Sunday afternoons. Where are the people? It's a private beach. We're the only ones who can be here. Is it yours? Yes, it's mine. Go ahead, run around, have some fun. We stood watching him. Come on, play. When we failed to move, he said, I've never seen a pair of kids who wouldn't play. It's your beach. I'm your father. My beach is your beach. We like beaches with people. You're very tough, you two. Does your mother ever tell you that? We shook our heads. Ah, so I'm seeing the real you, the real you, plural. No, she is. She may think so, but I know better. Visibly heartened by this notion, he unbuttoned his Hawaiian shirt. Our father wore sh shorts year-round, day and night, but we'd never seen him bare-chested. It turned out that today, maybe always, his shorts were actually swim trunks. Come on, kiddos, he said, taking our hands and trotting us over the powdery sand toward the sea. We don't have bathing suits. You're wearing leotards. That's the same thing. It was true. We each wore a sleeveless danskin with an elastic waisted ballet skirt pulled over it, and the soft leather ballet slippers we'd gotten for Christmas. Wait, we need to take off our skirts. He paused while we slid them off and folded them neatly on top of our ballet slippers, two little piles in the blinding white. I like that, the way you take good care of your things. We stepped into the shimmering water with our father. 
the absence of a crowd, of music playing on boom, on boom boxes, of roller skaters and dogs and cigarette butts and popsicle sticks buried in the sand made it seem like an imaginary beach. We swam with our father. We were seven and eight years old, and we remembered that swim as the first nice time we ever had with him. The music had stopped by the time he brought us inside his house, which was big and airy, with warm tile floors and ceiling fans slowly spinning and bright flowers and vases and a swimming pool in the middle of everything. We had lived in that house, which might have been why we felt comfortable there, despite its grandeur. A maid show us, showed us how to work the fancy shower and gave us huge fluffy towels to dry off with. We kept the towels around us while our dance skins dried in the dryer. Tell me when you're dressed, our father called from outside the bathroom door. Only after we chanted, we are, did he open it. On the drive home, we looked out over the cliff at a dusty orange sunset. We felt fresh and clean and enchanted, like we were returning from a land in a fairy tale. Down below, where our apartment was, it already seemed to be night, our mother was waiting for us outside. Gosh, you're even later than I thought, she said. We ran to her and threw our arms around her waist. We missed you. We went to the beach. Our father stood in the shadows until we remembered to turn and say goodbye. I'd like to spend more time with them, he said. He learned pigtails, ponytails, even ballet buns, which he sculpted fastidiously, insisting on starting over again if hairs were stray or sloppy or caught. Other parents smiled at the sight of him, pinching bobby pins between his lips. Everyone knew who he was. He'd made the careers of enough rock stars to be a star himself. People joked with him and tried to act like they knew him better than they did. Our father froze them out. He was prim in our company, as if his fame were a dull encumbrance he would have liked to be rid of. Our father's swimming pool looked nothing like the garish turquoise tubs we'd glimpsed in apartment complexes near ours, littered with palm tree debris. His pool was the color of stone, full of lightly salted water, accessible from almost every room in, in the house. The pool was to his home what the palm tree was to ours. On our second visit, he evaluated our swim strokes, found them dangerously wanting, and arranged for twice we weekly lessons with an instructor in his pool. Occasionally, we stayed for dinner. Eduardo, our father's cook, made fajitas and guacamole and pitchers of margaritas for whoever was around, usually some combination of our four half-siblings, whom we barely knew, and musicians our father was working with. Under a cast iron chandelier whose fat candles dripped wax into the middle of a massive slab of dining table, our father grew loud and loose, a showman we didn't recognize or like. Look at Lana and Melora, he said one night. They don't approve. Everyone turned and we felt our faces get hot. They're tough customers, those two. They've got me doing pigtails and buns. Incredulous laughter. I don't believe you, said Charlie, our oldest sister. She dragged her chair next to our father and offered him her golden hair, which fell almost to her waist. Make a bun, she dared him. Our father gathered Charlie's hair in, in his fists, but seemed at first unsure what to do with it. Girls, he roused us, get me the pins and brush. Serious stickler, came the table howls. Our father brushed Charlie's hair until it crackled in the candlelight. Then he herded it into a shimmering bundle and looped it expertly around, pins pursed between his teeth. Silence fell in the room as everyone watched. Our father slid the pins into Charlie's hair and anchored in place a beautiful, shining bun. It made Charlie look like a little girl, although she must have been in her 20s by then. Laughter broke at the table and everyone clapped. Charlie's eyes brimmed and overflowed. I don't know why I'm crying, she kept saying as she flicked away the tears, but they wouldn't stop. We knew why. We were getting the best of him. All right, I'm gonna pause there. Thank you.
So that's a long chapter, um, and that was just the beginning. And I'm now going to jump to the next chapter called What the Forest Remembers. Once upon a time, in a faraway land, there was a forest. It's gone now, burned, and the four men walking in it are gone too, which is what makes it far away. Neither it nor they exist. But in June 1965, the redwoods have a velvety, primeval look that brings to mind leprechauns or gin or fairies. Three of the four men have never been in these ancient woods, and to them, the forest looks otherworldly. So removed is it from their everyday vistas of wives and children and offices. The oldest, Lou Klein, is only 31, but all were born in the 1930s and raised without antibiotics, their military service completed before they went to college. Men of their generation got started on adulthood right away. So, Four men moving among trees whose musculature resembles the thighs of giants. When the men throw back their heads in search of the sunlight, I'm sorry, to search the sunlight for the tree's pointed tips, they grow dizzy. That's partly because they've just smoked marijuana. Not a common practice in 1965, especially among squares, as anyone would agree these four are, or three of them. There is a leader. There is usually a leader when men leave their established perimeters, and today it is Quinn Davies, a tanned, open-faced man accoutred with artifacts of a Native American ancestry he wishes he possessed. Normally, Quinn would wear a blazer like the rest of them, but today he's donned what strikes his pals as a costume, a purple velvet coat and heavy moccasins that prove far better suited to, to navigating this soft undergrowth than the Oxfords they're sliding around in. Only Lou manages to keep pace with Quinn, despite the fawn-like skittering this feat requires of him. Lou would rather look spasmodic than risk falling behind. These men all moved to California recently, driven by a lust for space that can't be satisfied by old cities with their tinge of Europe and horse carts and history. There is an un ungoverned feel to California's mountains and deserts and reckless coast. Quinn Davies, the only bachelor in the group, is homosexual and was on the lookout early for a graceful exit from Bridgeport, Connecticut, where his family has lived for generations. After the Navy, he followed the Beats to San Francisco, but now that he's here, they've proved maddeningly elusive. Still, there are always sailors who share Quinn's view that a man can be a multitude of ways depending on circumstances. He has a flickering hope about one of the other four, Ben Hobart from Minnesota, married to his high school sweetheart, a father of three, but it's too soon to tell. All four work in San Francisco in banking, doing their part to feed an expansion that will draw more restless folk like themselves to the city. Over drinks on Montgomery Street a few weeks back, they got to talking about grass, as marijuana is known even to those who have never seen it. They know grass is around, but what is it exactly? What does it do? All four like to drink. Quinn Davies drinks so that those around him will drink too which occasionally makes possible an unexpected adventure. Ben Hobart drinks because it subdues a greedy energy that can find no outlet with his wife and kids. Tim Breezley drinks because he's depressed, but that isn't a word he would use. Tim drinks to feel happy. He drinks because after several, several bourbons, he's overcome by a sensation of soaring lightness, as if he'd finally set down a pair of heavy valises he didn't realize he was carrying. Tim Breezley has a complaining wife and four complaining daughters. Inside his small Clement Street house, he drifts in a tide of shrill feminine discontent that followed him here all the way from Michigan, ranging from aggrieved and exhausted, his wife, to shrieking and infantile, the baby. No matter how much Lou Klein drinks, and he drinks a lot, a part of him is always removed, watching with faint detachment as the men around him get plastered. Lou is waiting for something. He thought it was love until he married Christine, whom he worships. 
Then he thought it was fatherhood, then moving west as they did two years ago, but the sensation of waiting persists. An intimation of some approaching change that has nothing to do with Christine or their kids or the house in Belvedere on a man-made lake where Lou swims a mile each morning and sails a sunfish. Life is good, it's perfect really, yet Lou is haunted by a sense of something just beyond it, something he's missing. Charlene, whom they call Charlie, is six. This morning she scrutinized Lou, wrinkling her sunburned nose and asked, where are you going? Short trip north, he said, some fishing, little duck hunting, maybe. You don't have a gun, Charlie said. She watched him evenly, her long, tangled hair raking the light. Lou found himself avoiding her eyes. The others do, he said. There will be no fishing, no hunting. What Quinn divulged that afternoon on Montgomery Street as they drank and smoked their parliaments and roared with laughter before driving their big cars home to their wife and kids was that he knew of some bohemians who grew grass in the middle of a forest near Eureka. They welcomed visitors. We can go overnight on a weekend sometime, if you like, Quinn said. They did. How can I possibly know all this? I was only six and stuck at home despite my fervent wish to come along. How dare I invent across chasms of gender, age, and cultural context? Trust me, I would not dare. Every thought and twinge I record arises from concrete observation, although getting hold of that information is arguably more presumptuous than inventing it would have been. Pick your poison. If imagining isn't allowed, then we have to resort to gray grabs. I got lucky. All four men's memories are in the collective consciousness, at least in part, surprising given their ages and downright miraculous in my father's case. He died in 2006, 10 years before Mandela's Own Your Unconscious was released. So how could my father have used it? Well, remember, Bix Boughton's genius lay in refining, compressing, and mass producing as a luscious, irresistible product, technology that already existed in crude form. Memory externalization had been whispered about in psychology departments since the early 2000s, with faculty speculating about its potential to revolutionize trauma therapy. What really happened? Wouldn't it help you to know what you've repressed? By the time one of my father's caregivers told us about a psychology professor at Pomona College who is uploading people's consciousnesses for an experimental project, my father had little to lose. He'd had five strokes and was expiring before our eyes. He wanted in. It fell to me to greet the young Pomona professor who wore red high top sneakers along with his two graduate students and a U-Haul full of equipment early one morning at my father's house in 2006. I parted the, the sparse remnants of my father's surfer's shag and fastened 12 electrodes to his head. Then he had to lie still for 11 hours. I sat beside him for most of the time. It seemed too intimate a process to let him undergo with strangers. I held his floppy hand while a wardrobe-sized machine rumbled beside us. After 11 hours, the wardrobe contained a copy of my father's consciousness in its entirety, every perception and sensation he had experienced starting at the moment of his birth. It's a lot bigger than a skull, I remarked to one of the graduate students who wheeled over a hand truck to take away the wardrobe. My father still wore the electrodes. The brain is a miracle of compression, the professor said. I have no memory of that exchange, by the way. I saw and heard it only when I reviewed that day from my father's point of view. Looking out through his eyes, I noticed, or rather he noticed, my short, uninteresting haircut, the middle-aged gut I was already starting to amass, and I heard him muse, but here isn't the right word. We don't hear our thoughts aloud exactly. How did that pretty little girl end up looking so ordinary? Let us return to the men, scrambling behind or alongside, in my father's case, Quinn Davies, their guide. 
A river flashes in and out of view below like a snake sliding among leaves. As they climb, the men's stumbling and guffawing yields to huffing, wheezing, and struggle. All four smoke cigarettes, and none exercise the way we think of it now. Even Ben Hobart, one of those preternaturally fit guys who can eat anything, is breathing too hard for speech by the time they crest the hill and glimpse A-frame, as the house is known. Tucked in a redwood clearing and built from the cleared redwood, A-frame is the sort of whimsical wood and glass structure that will become a cliche of 1970s California architecture. But to these men, it looks like an apparition from a fairy tale. Is it real? What kinds of people live here? Compounding the eeriness is Simon and Garfunkel's sound of silence, welling from hi-fi speakers facing outward on the redwood deck. A-Frame's mastermind, Tor, has somehow managed to wire a house in the middle of a forest approachable only on foot. Hello, darkness, my old friend. A hush of awe engulfs the four as they approach. Lou falls back, letting Quinn lead the way into a soaring cathedral of space whose vast triangular windows reach all the way to its pointed ceiling. The scent of redwood is overpowering. Quinn introduces Tor, an austere eminence in his 40s with long, prematurely white hair. Tor's old lady, Bari, is a warmer, zoftig presence. An assortment of young people mill around the main room and deck, showing no interest in the new arrivals. This odd setup leaves our three newcomers unsure what to do with themselves. Lou, who can't tolerate feeling like a hanger-on, is abruptly angry with Quinn, who speaks quietly and privately with Tor. What the hell kind of greeting is this? Nowadays, a man ill at ease in his surroundings will pull out his phone, request the Wi-Fi password, and rejoin a virtual sphere where his identity is instantly reaffirmed. Let us all take a moment to consider deeply what isolation was customary before these times arrived. The only possible escape for Lou and his friends involves retracing their steps through the forest without breadcrumbs to guide them. The desultory group begins at last to congregate around Tor in preparation for getting high. The yard birds are playing, but the world of their music is too far from Lou's own world for him to enjoy it. Still, he welcomes the sense of incipient coherence, a fresh structure of meaning. Tor has a knack for orchestrating such moments, intimate of Kerouac, occasional lover of Cassidy, future provider of LSD for Kesey, Wavy, Stone, and the rest, Tor is one of those essential figures who catalyze action in other people and then fade into non-existence without making it into the history. Over the course of an hour's communal smoking and music changes, the group wafts into a state of blinkered absorption that is unprecedented for Lou, Tim, and Ben, who until now have known only booze as a means of consciousness alteration. Basic exchanges elongate like time-lapse fruits ripening and dropping into outstretched hands. This grass was grown around here? Ben Hobart asking Tor. Yeah, the crop is walking distance. Quinn answering Ben Hobart. You live up here full time? Lou asking Tor. We finished building a year ago, Bari answering Lou. Tor, you may notice, says virtually nothing. He has a story too, but I can't tell it. He and Bari are childless, and there are no intimates memories in the collective to scavenge from. Tor will pass away long before the era of Own Your Unconscious. We have only these glimpses of him through the eyes of his acquaintances. There are still some mysteries left. I'll stop there. So now 
I'm very happy to have a conversation. Yes, I see a hand in the middle. Yes, you. Hi. On Apple TV, there's a show called Severance, and some of the characters' last names are Egan. Are you aware of this show? Do you have any connection? Um, I, am, I am aware of the show, but I have not watched it. Um, and I think I the writers like you. I'm sorry? I think the writers like you. <laughs> Maybe, uh, but yeah. we have to see how they're spelling Egan. There are many variants. All right. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. There's one right there. Hi, thanks for the reading. Um, I had a question. It's a, I think, a pretty easy one uh, that I know the answer to. Uh, when you were writing a visit from the Goon Squad, did it ever cross your mind that in maybe 10, 15 years I'll revisit this because I want to see how technology advances and I want to see if I still care about these characters? And if the answer to that is yes, when you were writing The Candy House, did you think maybe in 10 years I'll put this sucker to bed? That's well, the answer is that I never really stopped writing about these people because even on my book tour for Goon Squad, I was actually already working on what became a chapter of The Candy House. So it's sort of the nature of these kinds of ensemble stories that they feel very open-ended because if every chapter is about a different person and of course every person is the center of their own complicated world, the possibilities seem to ramify with every single additional chapter. Um, and I think one reason I especially was, was that Goon Squad felt unfinished was that in both of these books, there's a lot of trial and error. So there's a lot of material that just ends up not working out. And so I was left with, like, for example, knowing more about certain people than the reader did because the chapters in which I had explored certain things ended up not in the book. So that, I never really stopped. It always felt like it was there waiting for me. The question was really, would this material add up to another book? And that I didn't know because my criteria are pretty high for what constitutes a book. Um, and I knew that I didn't want to write, you know, fan fiction of my own book. That seemed pretty unappealing. Um, so the question was, will these disparate chapters add up to a story that really has its own um, integrity and is fun? Um, and that, I didn't know that for a while. But the second part of your question, am I already thinking about what, what next in this way? In a way, no. And I think the reason is the Candy House draws a wider circle around Goon Squad, but still holds together. I can't draw the circle any wider and have unity. So the only way to keep writing about these people would be to pick one part of it and dig more deeply into that, which I may do, but I, I, I guess somehow it feels a little different. Um, I, I wonder if maybe these, these are just left as a pair. We'll see. I'm open to anything. <laughs> Some questions up here. Hi, thank you so much um, for gracing us. Um, so I wanted to ask, I find your writing to be the type of rare writing that really makes me feel like you can do anything in writing. Like you can break all the rules and be really creative and yeah, just, and, and so I'm wondering if either now or when you first started writing, if there are writers that inspired you to change the rules and go in different directions. Well, I think that, you know, the earliest novels are, are what we would call experimental, if you look to like 18th century or late 17th century. And so I, I guess in a way, I feel like when I take formal chances, which often don't work out, I should add, I only include the ones that I think did work out. Um, but to me, it feels like looking back toward the, the early, the tradition of the novel that the novel began with, which was doing things that were weird, that were hard to do in epic poetry. Um, and novels like Don Quixote or um, Tristram Shandy 
pull in, you know, legal documents, letters. There's a very eclectic quality and a very flexible quality to these books. So I think though that's, you know, I read a lot of those books in graduate school. And I think at that point, I felt like, oh, these are, we these are po quote unquote postmodern. Um, I, I want to make sure that I remember that the, that the novel was invented to do all these things. Um, so that I, I bear those in mind a lot. And I feel like I'm actually kind of a traditionalist in that way. Thank you. Hi. At the, uh, toward the end of your, <coughs> toward, toward the end of the book, Gregory suggests that the ability to um, acquire or share the consciousness and, and, and memory of the other, another, um, causes an existential threat to the continuance of fiction. And I'm, I'm wondering what um, you think made him say that, and and whether there anything exists in current technology, um, like AI, for instance, that you think may constitute some equivalent threat. Well, I so far, I don't see an existential threat to, to fiction. I mean, um, ChatGPT is sort of a, 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 you know, an amazing new development. I haven't personally used it. I've just read the tsunami of uh, articles about it. Um, and it's, you know, of course, there's a part of me that sort of freezes up whenever I hear about, you know, a machine doing anything that replaces people, but certainly writing. Um, but my next impulse is, okay, so ChatGBT is using the, uh, a, co a collective of utterances that all of us have given it in the form of the internet. So it's partaking of our own groupthink. And in a way, I feel like that's what that's what I do when I don't write in the spontaneous um, way that I have to write to do anything good. If I sit down in a chair and I think, oh, I'm going to write a story, the things I come up with aren't good. They're not original. And it's because I think I'm partaking of that same groupthink that ChatGPT and anything like it is using. So I guess what I'm really saying is to do anything good what has always been necessary is to get out ahead of that group think, which we all partake of. And I guess if, you know, if ChatGPT makes us fiction writers up our game a little, you know, so much better for the genre. But I do, there are, I mean, the reason that I think nothing has threatened fiction, I mean, everything threatens fiction, but the reason nothing has utterly displaced it yet is that at least I have not seen anything that does exactly what fiction does, which is to put us, put us inside the mind of another human being. Most of the threats come in the form of screen products. And if you're looking at an image of someone, you are by definition on the outside. So it is a different art. Um, when our, one of our sons started watching streamers uh, playing video games and narrating their experience, I, at first I thought, you know, the apocalypse has really arrived because now we're not just arguing about whether he'll play video games, he now wants to watch other people play video games. Like, how could this possibly be a good idea? But then when I watched a little, I suddenly thought, oh, I totally get it. We have the illusion that we're inside this person's mind because we're watching the game they are playing and we're hearing them narrate their thoughts as they play. So that's kind of the experience. If that's what makes fiction fun, we feel like we're inside someone else's mind. The difference is that the streamer is not narrating all that's in their mind. It's a performative act. And in fact, we are looking at an image and listening to a performance. So I think fiction still wins, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure every streaming fan would agree with me. <laughs> uh, yes, back there. Oh, actually, wait, right next to you, there's a question. Yeah, and then in back. Hi, thank you so much. So um, technology is one of the main themes your work revolves around. I am very curious to, to know when did you start being interested in technology and how? And also to what extent your relationship with Steve Jobs uh, influenced, this, influenced this trajectory? Thank you. I am not interested in technology, believe it or not. Um, well, I, I have a split feeling about it. As a citizen, as a technology user, I fear it. I'm bad at it. Operator error is a common phrase in our home. 
like, it doesn't work. That's my relationship to technology. I'm a late adopter. I usually wait until you know a, a glass of water pours into my laptop and I have to replace it. Um, and I'm and and even more fundamentally, I'm just not drawn to it. Like the idea of a shiny new device, that to me just translates into time that it's going to take me to figure out how to use it. So I'm not drawn to it. As a writer, I think the reason I'm I'm interested in it and find myself returning to it is that it is, in a way, the big story that I've witnessed in my lifetime. You know, I was born in 1962. By the time I got to college, the only telecommunications in innovation I was aware of was call waiting. So that's not much in 18 years. And then a, a, a tremendous acceleration began, which we all continue to, to witness. And it has, of course, changed our lives. There's no way around it. Um, and I guess I'm interested in what those changes are like, how it has changed our lives. And I guess the question I come up against again and again is, how has it changed our interior lives? And if so, how? And that is such an interesting question to explore in fiction because fiction is the most interior narrative art form. So I think that's why I keep coming back to it. It's not really out of a genuine liking for it, but a, 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 an amazement at its proliferation and evolution and the impact that it has on people. Okay, and there was a couple in the back. I have a question about your writing process. And when you think about language versus form versus story, like what comes first? Like, do you come up with the story first and kind of rewrite it to make it sound good and fit the form you envisioned? Or does it all come together at once? Just curious about that process. Well, I would say that the language definitely comes early, although often it's not the right language. Um, what the, the entry point for me is time and place. So really atmosphere, definitely not story. Um, so I sort of begin in an environment and the natural first question is who is perceiving this environment? And that's the beginning of a character. And then who else is present? So we're starting to get a sense of, you know, who might be in the story. And then they do things. Um, and that's the beginning of a plot. But when I say it, I work improvisationally, what I mean is that I don't at the beginning have a plan because as I said, the plan I would think of is not going to be interesting enough. It works much better for me to blindly kind of feel my way toward a line of action that feels alive, which seems to me what improvisation is if it's happening on stage, let's say. I've never done it, but I've been in the audience and it feels like everyone's sort of working together and like going where it feels most alive and not pulling back, but just going forward. Um, the language, the sort of way that the story is spoken is something that I, that in some ways comes spontaneously and naturally, but I also get it wrong a lot. Um, I'm, I often have sort of a hangover from the previous project that I've worked on. And since what I tend to work, do things that are pretty different from the last thing I've done, bringing language with me is often not a helpful approach to the next thing. So there's a lot of you know, feeling my way, feeling what works and doesn't. And then I also have a writing group that I dedicated the Candy House to, and they are really helpful, especially in the realm of just how does it sound? We only read aloud, you know, just reading it to people, hearing it myself and, and feeling whether the language is, is, is the right one to speak this story. So there's a lot of trial and error and a lot of uh, kind of instinct. And then once I have a first draft and type it up, then I start thinking in a more analytical way, okay, what is this? What's interesting about it? How can I make it better? I think there's maybe one there. In your first passage, uh, it sounded like you used a point of view that was plural. It was told from a, a sort of we perspective. Can you talk about uh, how you arrived at that decision? So I sometimes, I do, with books, the fun of books like this for me is that they give me a kind of low commitment way to do things that are fun, but I might not want to try to sustain over a whole book. 
So I often actually keep a list of things that I want to try. Some of them I still have not pulled off. Um, but first person plural, talk, uh, narrating in the we form, was definitely on my list. Other people have done it. I mean, the virgin suicides, Jeffrey Eugenides is told in that way. And I remember when I read it for the first time, just being awestruck that he was able to use this, this voice so effectively. So I had first person plural on my list and I kept thinking, okay, what is the story that will demand to be told that way? Because that's always the challenge. You know, I, it doesn't work to just say, oh, it'll be fun to use this approach and then just kind of jam it onto material. That does not work ever. Um, so I actually tried a few different uh, combinations of people to narrate a, a story in the candy house. There was a different family where, that has three children that I tried to have narrate as we, and it really didn't work. And the reason was that they, there was, uh, the reason it didn't work is the reason it always works in these cases, which is there's no reason for them to be telling the story as we, except that I feel like doing it. And that's not reason enough. In this case, I, I, as soon as I landed on these children, I was relieved because when I am trying to do something that's a little bit unusual, n normally when I try to do it, it feels constraining. And that's a sign that it's not appropriate to this material. But with these two narrating as one, I felt a sense of freedom. And that's always a really good sign and a sign that I've found an approach that, that the story demands. Um, so that was kind of a relief. It happened pretty late in the process, actually, that I finally got to use the Wii. I think I tried it for Goon Squad, too, and couldn't get away with it. So that was a nice box to finally check. <laughs> we have time for two more questions. All right, I see way back. And I'm happy to continue this conversation outside after everyone, if you didn't get to ask. Uh, you write so wonderfully about music, and I feel like there's such a like rock and roll soul, uh, particularly to this book and, and Goon Squad. I'm just curious the role of music in your writing process itself, not so much literally, but you know, when you look at the way you use sound of silence in that scene, are you like hearing that uh, while you're thinking about the scene or planning the scene or writing the scene? Like, what, what role is music playing uh, in that way, if that makes sense at all? You know, it, it doesn't play as large a role as you might think. Um, just as with technology, I'm as a, as a regular person, I, I'm not that knowledgeable about music, but it interests me a lot. Um, both its role culturally and especially as a kind of mood setter and a time travel device, music is so powerful. Um, I certainly was thinking of that song as I wrote that scene and the eeriness of it. And sometimes... I, especially in Goon Squad, I used music to kind of recalibrate my mood and approach from chapter to chapter. But one way, I think the biggest way that I use music is when I listen to any music, I'm often listening to the structure and thinking about how it, it achieves its effect and whether I can use that in fiction. So I actually think explicitly about that, even listening to like indie pop. In fact, I think that's almost helped me the most. The band Not A Surf, I feel like they should get a writing credit because they're, they're, they have a couple of songs that are oddly structured and I would find myself, I'm a real repeat listener. I'll put one song on repeat and listen to it until I, you know, I'm gagging from it, which is a little sad because then I can never listen to it again. But in that intense love affair that I have with the song, I will think carefully about how it achieves its effect and I will have notes in my many notes that say things like, um, use a structure like not a surf's paper boats. That will be right on the same list with first person plural. So I'm very greedy about musical structure. Okay, green shirt here has a question. And then anyone who didn't get to, we'll, we'll talk out there. Something I appreciated so much about your reading tonight and also in Visit from the Goon Squad is the emphasis on the children's perspective. I'm thinking of the final scene in the book and also just the way that you achieve both, you know, not condescending, but um, a realistic and also honest perspective. What 
drives you to write from a children's perspective? What can you see from that perspective that you're not able to get from others? And how do you inhabit that as not a child? <laughs> well, I've been a child. <laughs> um, I don't find it hard to inhabit a child's perspective. I have a terrible memory about a lot of things, but I do think I remember what it felt like to be various different ages. I certainly, there's a chapter in here that's narrated stream of consciousness by an anxious 13 year old. And I, I can't, I couldn't have loved more unleashing the, the, the 13 year old in me who sees everything in all caps and thinks the world is ending every five minutes. Um, so I think, I think I have a, an advantage that way that I just actually remember a lot of, uh, moments and facts from my own life pretty well. Um, in terms of why do it, you know, in a way, it, it's a great question. It's worth asking that question about every craft choice. And, it, and I often find myself thinking in a kind of cost-benefit analysis way, which is kind of weird because I'm not very business-like, but with every choice, you gain some advantages and you lose some possibilities. Um, you know, from a child's perspective, you gain this kind of um, fresh and open relationship to the world that that most adults don't have, but you lose the kind of wisdom and synthesis of an adult perspective. So the question is: Are you, you do you get enough from the advantages you're gaining to compensate for the lack of the other stuff? Um, and in, on, on occasion, it feels like the answer is yes, but. I can't imagine, I, I, I haven't ever found, been moved to narrate a whole book from a child's perspective. And I think maybe that's because I feel like what I would lose is, is too great. It would, not, um, it would not justify what I would gain. So I'm always asking those questions. And in a book like this, in a way, I'm so lucky because I can bring in so many different perspectives. Um, and so it becomes a chance to do things that I couldn't really sustain over a whole book. I mean, in fact, you know, the, the, the first person plural is another example. I would not want to be limited to that for a whole book. There's a chapter narrated basically in the second person, um, the uh, first person, uh, describing her, her, um, actions saying, you do this, you do that. Again, I can't imagine doing that for a whole book, but it was fun to have it for one chapter. So I enjoy with books like this, having the chance to explore things that, that seem fun and might work well together. All right. Let's give her a big hand. Hook. Thank you so much. All right. So the night is not over. Um, we still have books. Um, so Jenny was kind enough to pre-sign a lot of books. We can go to the bookstore and buy them and then come back here and get in line uh, in the center aisle here to have them personalized. And then you can ask more questions and um, we'll have fun together. So stick around and remember that caring is sharing. And when you buy signed books for other people, they make great gifts. So thank you. <laughs>